Ghost in the Valley podcast. I'm your host, Al Cooley. Today I have Amber Rose Washington on. She is an author. She is a singer-songwriter. She's worked with American Idol. Her songs have been released around the world. And she is my first trans guest on tonight. And I really had a great conversation with her. She will be sharing some of her ghost stories with us. Please check out Amber's links at the bottom of this episode. I will be right back with my conversation with Amber Rose Washington right after these messages. You awaken in a cold sweat. Your heart races and your breath quickens. It's 3 a.m. and you're not alone. Something lurks in the corner of the room and it's darker than the night. You're deep in the woods, enjoying a family camping trip. Marshmallows roast and laughs are shared until something screams from behind the rig. It's neither human nor animal, but something in between. You can't see it, but it sees you. You're driving down a dark, lonely road, singing along to your favorite song when something dressed in white crosses your path. You swerve to an immediate stop and check your rearview mirror, but nothing's there. The people are real, and the stories are legend. The problem is that legends are often riddled in myth. We uncover the truth. Tune in to Paratruth Radio every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, anywhere podcasts are found. Today I have Amber Rose Washington on the show. Amber is a musician, a songwriter, a producer. She's worked in Hollywood on American Idol. She's had number one tracks in England and in France. She's been on NBC, CBS, NPR, BBC, on radio stations in five countries. Uh, She's been on numerous other podcasts. And somehow Amber has found time somewhere in there, in that busy life, to write a book. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to start with you, Amber. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, Al, you did a great job. I mean, I am sort of all over the map with what I do, and uh, you did a good job. You know, kudos to you. <laughs> I, I did my research. I'm like, <laughs> wow. I mean, that's that's busy. Plus, you have children. And I do, I, I do have children. And I, I um the thing about my life is I, I I coined a term a long time ago, occupational ADD. And you know, when you use occupational ADD, it's like regular ADD. It's just, you know, I I I want to do a million things and I want to do them all at the same time. And I somehow for the past 30 years of my life have been able to do that. And I've been blessed to meet so many wonderful people uh, in, in the music business and in Hollywood uh, that, you know, helped me along my journey in life, which is interesting to say the least. I know we're going to talk about, you know, ghost stories and paranormal stuff, but, you know, I've had an interesting life myself. I was, you know, to your audience, I was born trans. I was assigned male at birth incorrectly. And you know, so I'm, I'm a trans woman. Uh, you know, they, they call me, I don't even know what they call me post-operative trans woman, I guess. I don't even know, you know, they, there's so many terms these days and, you know, I'm not one for labels and terms except to bring advocacy to a group of people, but, you know, I was in the music business for 26 years. I was, uh, I, I was in Nashville, New York and Hollywood, uh, you know, Los Angeles recording and, performing and doing stage management for really large artists. And believe it or not, I was actually doing voiceovers. And a lot of you, maybe you've heard my voice before. It's hard to say. But when I did my stint in Nashville, uh, where I had most of my success, believe it or not, I actually did a lot of voiceover work for a lot of country music artists that I've worked with, you know, on stage with. And I was that person that would say, you know, coming this Saturday at the arena, you know, welcome so-and-so. And And it was this uh, ungodly, very deep, (laughs) masculine (laughs) voice that was just 
cringeworthy for me because it was so opposite of me. But, you know, you know, why did I do that? Because society is crummy to people like me. And why? I have no idea. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want to be born this way for heaven's sake. No. Um, you know, and here we are. So you, you end up being stronger for what, what you, what you have to fight, you know, just to survive. It, it makes you stronger. It makes you more empathetic. And I am empathetic to a lot of people. And so a lot of my journey is about my book that I just wrote, which is hiding for myself. And uh, you accurately depict it. You know, it's it's actually in 36 countries. It went to Amazon number two um, this past year, which was a milestone for me in that regard. Because segueing from songwriter to to author is not the easiest thing in the world. You would think it is, but it's not. I'm writing a book myself, and I'm, I'm me also being a songwriter and musician. Yeah, uh, it's it's a. It's, I know the the publishing and the copyrights. I know all that. Yeah, you know, but because I had my own production company also for like twenty years, but you know, you know, stepping into being an author, that I was like, oh, I can get this because I grew up in a house for four years that was haunted. So that's what my, that's what my book's about. So I says so I got this, you know. But I'll tell you what, wow, you know, <laughs> you know, trying to. <laughs> put that in words and yeah, you know, the little, and it's like, you know, it's a whole different line to me than the songwriting. But that's great that you're doing that. That's wonderful. And by the way, I have to say this before we get too far ahead of ourselves. You have a fantastic voice. Oh, thank you. I really do. I, I like, <laughs> I like the tonality of your voice. Yeah. Yeah. You could do radio or, or commercial spots, you know, voiceover. Getting to your, well, your like you're saying, your, your post uh, production, or you're, you know, doing the, uh, intros and uh i mean you don't think about it but that person that you, you don't see you you think maybe sometimes they put you there because they can't see you that's what that's what they think sometimes but you know what my thing was is the biggest thing i used to have to do is get up in front of thirty five thousand people and and tell the audience hello and introduce the groups that were coming out sometimes introduce the opening act that would play some of my music, uh, which was very flattering, you know, opening up a Brad Paisley concert and there's your song being thrown in there. That's a wonderful thing. But, you know, I never had, I never had a, a huge affliction with what we call stage fright, which is what my book that I'm going to be finished with and probably out on, on the shelves by January getting over stage fright. So it's overcoming stage fright in a New York minute. <laughs> it's a good name <laughs> of a book. And, Hell yeah. you know, it, I used to have to, you know, get in front of large audiences, anywhere from as small as a hundred people to 35,000 people, you know, in a concert setting. And, and just when that audience screams back at you, when you're the only other person on the stage, it's electric. I have to tell you, you know, so I teach people a very interesting method that I used for contestants that were going on American Idol. I, I used to teach people how to get over stage fright. And I have a method that can cure, I, I hate to use that word, but it can actually help you within within a, a short amount of time. And dare I say 48 hours, you can actually get in front of an audience and do that. And I have these live exercises that I do where I take the most timid, shy individual with social anxiety and and make them shine like a like a star just by a few simple adjustments. Oh, like for working for uh, American Idol, you know. So you might have contestants on there who have never played in that type of audience, or that you have millions of people watching you and getting them past that that stage alone. You know, my gig was was before before that part, and I would have to get these people to a point where they could actually audition in front of them because a lot of people don't understand this about American Idol. American Idol is one of those shows where, you know, 10,000 people descend on a, on a football stadium. And the reality is, is there's only about 1500 wristbands, which means about 1500 of, of the 10,000 are going to get some sort of audition, but the audition that they're going to go through is, is a multi-phase audition with what we call these producers. And they're, young people that we call producers and they are weeding out you know with with some supervision the the good ones the bad ones and the medio mediocre ones i should say mm -hmm. and a lot of people that are 
thrusting themselves into that situation are very um, inexperienced with singing in front of large groups of people, let alone, you know, people that are judging you. Because let's be honest, stage fright is really the fear of yourself. It's not the fear of other people. It's the fear of yourself because you don't want to be judged. You don't want to look like a fool. You don't want to mess up. It's always, it's always you centric. It's not them centric. So I teach people and you're going to have to buy the book to get the rest out of me. Oh, but. Yeah. I, I, am, I do plan on getting the book. I go on Amazon and look for Amber Rose Washington. The book is called Hiding from Myself. Apart, you know what? I don't know if you wrote this or if the publisher wrote this or uh, I, I loved some of the things that on advertising the book. Yeah. This is a warm, funny, educational, and very human story. A reminder that we are all just humans trying to be our best. The best part that I like is also being unapologetic for being the person you were meant to be. Yeah. And you know what's what's interesting is you tapped into, there's actually four people that uh, most of your audience should be, you know, at least know who they are. One of the people that wrote a testimonial for me, it's a whole page long. In fact, it's the first page of my book is Colin Mockery. He's from Whose Line Is It Anyway? You know, that comedy show mm -hmm, where they stand mm -hmm. up and do that. So, you know, he's he's a wonderful man. And he wrote me a, a beautiful testimonial to the book because obviously he read it before it came out. Another one of my friends from Hollywood, Adam Glass, who, God, he's done so much, you know, uh, Criminal Minds uh, Beyond Borders. He's He's worked on so many different things. He was in a comic book. Uh, industry. He's in Hollywood producing all sorts of TV shows. He's produced shows uh, for Showtime and written for Showtime and Netflix and, and so many different arenas. And there's actually a small bio of him on my website, amberrosewashington.com. So having friends in the industry write these wonderful things, like what you just read was actually from one of them. And it's just touching to hear people authentically read my story and really understand what authenticity is really about right from the get-go. It really, it really made my day um, when I first came out with the, the treatment, I called it, of the book. And, you know, to have them say those things was, was really uh, a shot in the arm, very, a very nice shot in the arm that uh, I have confirmation that I wrote a book that people are going to relate with, you know? Right. That's available on, on Amazon. And I will put all the links to your book and your song, everything in the, in the show notes. Uh, you also did a song. You wrote a song because you're, you're a songwriter. Yeah. And the, uh, I, I listened to it. I watched the video. It, it just blew me away. It's a very good song. I really loved it. Uh, I think it was by uh, Mandy Miller. Yeah, she was an artist that I produced a while back. If I Leave, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that song, um, that was actually uh, produced in Hollywood. And the song has the guys from the American Idol Band actually performing on it, along with me. And uh, I, I brought the song back to New York, had her sing it, did all the mastering in New York, and uh, released the song. and went to Nashville with the song, had a bunch of my Nashville friends uh, in the business listen to it. And they said, you know what you got to do, don't you? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I've written over 250 songs. You know, I've written a lot of songs and, and some of them did pretty well. And some of them did mediocre. And this was just one of those crossover songs that I didn't know where it belonged because it was sort of country, sort of crossover. I didn't, really know. So they said, send it to the United Kingdom. And I was like, oh God, that's the, that's the, the word of death right there. <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to get this. And you know what? I sent it there and eight weeks later, wow, it exploded. It went to number one on the independent charts. And I was, I had like tens and tens of, now back in the day, tens of thousands of downloads is a good thing. And, yeah. you know, Within a few weeks, I had, you know, close to 100,000 downloads of this song. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, they really like it. This is wonderful. So long story short, that that was the part of the stint that got me working with so many interesting people uh, from Taylor Swift to Keith Urban, Lone Star, Brad Paisley, the guys from Rascal Flats, 
there's just a, a long list and I can't think of them all right now. And, and <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's just, you know, one of those things where you get on the spot and you can't think of them all. And then after the show, I'm going to say, Oh yeah, I forgot the most important few people. <laughs> but um, I know you want to hear about these ghost stories of mine, you know, before we get started, let's, let's, let's dive into the ghost thing just a little bit. I was asked a few months ago with another individual who's actually a screenwriter in Hollywood if we can pass this little test where we can write a screenplay in four days. Now, the person that I'll be writing this with is actually one of the masters of horror. So she has lots of movies out already. Um, you know, and, and one of her mentors was John Carpenter, of course, that wrote Halloween mm-hmm. or produced direct Halloween. And we are going to be staying, you know, cross my fingers, we're going to be staying in the house the original house of the conjuring. Whoa. And we our goal is to leave our cell phones out to cut ourselves off from civilization for 4 days and write an original screenplay while we are in that atmosphere. And I think it's so cool. <laughs> I've heard I, that that house is still has activity in it. It does. We were originally going to shoot for the Amityville Horror House, but the people that own it now you know, they, they, they just want to be left alone and I don't blame them. I want them to be left alone too. And, you know, but they did try to get us in there and that it was a hard no. So we moved on and apparently what they do at the conjuring house in Rhode Island is they actually rent it out to different groups of people, you know, uh, paranormal investigators and people that just want a ghost experience. I gotta be honest. I don't, really know if there's anything going on there or not or you know i i'm sort of believe it or not i'm sort of the type of person that's sort of a skeptic until proven otherwise Mm -hmm. even though i grew up in a haunted house (laughs) (laughs) go figure that one out um but yeah i was i was actually uh brought up in upstate new york in sullivan county and incidentally that county and the town i'm from liberty was actually the town and county behind the movie Dirty Dancing. Okay. So in the 60s and 50s, it was really a vacation mecca. It was really a, a hot spot. Well before I was born, it all disappeared. <laughs> so when I was born, it was already on its way down, unfortunately, uh, from all those hotels and whatnot that existed there. But there existed a lot of history. And the house that I grew up in was built in the 1920s by a veterinarian, the local veterinarian in our in our township. And we moved in there when I was two years old. And I'm dating myself. It was 1970. And almost immediately upon moving in, strange things started happening to my parents. And by the time I was about five, maybe four, maybe even before school, I was already experiencing some of those things for myself. So without further ado, if you don't mind, I'll tell you a couple of those things. Oh, yeah. So when I was a young child, I had my bedroom in the same room that had the attic door. So imagine, if you will, a colonial house built in the 1920s, basically looks like a three-story house, but the top story has these eerie looking windows, sort of not quite Amityville horror type windows, but somewhat close if you stare at it long enough. There was a full-size attic door in my bedroom. So the closets were really small. It was just a single door closet. And then next to my closet, facing the closet, was the attic door. And you open it and you go up this uh, finished stairway up to a full-size attic. I was scared to death of being in that room for some reason. I was terrified from a very young age. And I didn't even know what a ghost was. But something made me afraid in that room right from the very get-go. One night, I'm falling asleep after mom and dad put me to bed. As I'm falling asleep, I start hearing footsteps above my head in the attic. And it really set me off because I knew nobody was up there. So apparently, and and this was told to me, obviously a four-year-old can't remember vivid details like this, but I remember most of it, but the the, the gory details are from my dad or my mom re-explaining this to me. Apparently what happened next was the attic door actually opened. I heard it it opened really slow. And the weird thing was, is once that attic door is closed in the 1920s house, 
when you close the door, man, it is closed. It is tightly shut. They don't just open or swing open. You know, they're not loose by any stretch of the imagination. This door just opened all by itself. And I'm laying in my bed with my covers almost over my head. At that point, I hopped out of bed and went downstairs and, and said I was scared. And they brought me back up to bed. And I said, there's something upstairs. And my dad promised there was nothing upstairs. He left the room. I immediately went to my doorway and, and got a, there was like a, a broomstick or a bat or something. And I, I flipped the light on in my room and went to bed with the light on. The door was shut. Like when we went up there, the door was closed. It wasn't open at all. So maybe it was my imagination, I thought. So 15 minutes later, I hear the door open again. This time I go to the edge of my bed and I see indeed the attic door is wide open. And I got this chill. I got this weird chill. I heard footsteps in the stairway of the attic, just totally freaked out. And I called for my dad. And, and before I could even get him up the stairs, I'm laying in my bed again. And I hear the footsteps walk out of my room. It was the weirdest thing. It was as if there was somebody in my room walking through it. My dad comes up. I said, the attic door is open. He goes, yeah, it is. But sometimes that happens. You know, maybe there was a, maybe there was a, you know, pressure because your window is open tonight. You know, maybe the, the window sucked the door open. You know, he had these excuses for everything for me. So he walks me upstairs in the attic. He forces me to go upstairs in the attic. And I was scared to death to go up there. And he said, look, here's your footsteps. And he points to a cast iron radiator. And he says, when it gets hot, you know, it turns to steam. And sometimes that steam makes things cling and clang. And, and it sounds like boards moving and creaking and all sorts of stuff. That's your, that's, that's what you're hearing. So I felt really good about that. So I went to bed 15 minutes later, that darn door opened again. Now my dad had shut it tight and closed my window. So there was just no way. Now let's fast forward a little bit. A couple of weeks of this relentless door opening happens. So I went downstairs one night before bed and I grabbed our entire encyclopedia book by book by book. They were so heavy. I had to carry them one by one. And I set them up right in front of the attic door so it couldn't open. So there was like 12 or 13 books stacked up on top <laughs> of themselves, probably what would amount to, I don't know, I'm guessing 80 pounds because they were really thick books. And so I got 80 pounds worth of books sitting in front of that door. And I went to bed feeling very, very good. Like that door is not opening tonight. As I was sleeping that night, I heard the creaking of the door again. And the door opened. The books fell to the ground and they were pushed out of the way. And I heard those footsteps again. And it just completely took me by surprise because I was not ready for, to experience that. Somehow, you know, I had a sister who was 18 months my junior. The word got out that I was scared of the attic and I used to get teased by all my friends. And they used to say, oh, she's scared of the attic, blah, blah, blah. And the, the weird thing about it is that no matter what I did or put in front of that door, the door would always find a way to open. You know, it was very bizarre. And so we finally put a padlock on the door so that it couldn't open. And that was when the door stopped opening until I was a teenager. So when I was a teenager, I was starting to write music, right? And when you're uh -huh. writing music, you know, I, I had my, my synthesizer in the room and, and, you know, my drum machine, all these things in the room. And I remember there was this one day when mom and dad and my sister went out to the store to get groceries and I stayed in the house and it looked like it was possibly going to rain that day. My window was open no wind or anything. I'm playing facing away from the attic door. And the attic door didn't bother me anymore because I, you know, I was a teenager now and I can handle that stuff. And I'm writing sort of this Pat Benatar meets Metallica sort of song. Like really for, for that day and age, it was cringeworthy stuff, like really heavy drums, heavy electric guitar, really loud. I hear the attic door slam open and hit the side, the side window, window banister of, of the house, which was behind the door. And then I turned around. As I turned around, the attic door was slamming shut. So it opened up really fast and then slammed shut. 
I stopped the music, obviously, as I turned around and it freaked me out. But what I did was I said, okay, my, my, my bedroom window is open. It had to be a breeze. So no worries. It's just the door getting sucked open. So I start playing the music again. This time, the attic door opens and closes and opens and closes three times, not two times, but three <laughs> times in a row. And I'm staring at the door as it does this. Like I'm seeing it open and close right before my eyes. Now my amygdala has taken over. I am frozen, paralyzed in place. I cannot move a muscle. I'm completely frozen with fear. I look at the window. The curtain isn't moving. I'm wondering how the heck did that just happen? So rather than running out of the room, I, I start walking over towards my bedroom window. And I got about 10 feet away from the window. And the window slammed shut. And the glass broke inward towards me. At that point, the attic door opened back up full bore. And at that point, I whipped open my, my bedroom door, ran down the stairs. And when I say run down the stairs, there's 14 stairs and I missed 11 of them. And ran outside into my front yard and looked up into my bedroom window and vowed I would never, ever enter that room ever again. Now, with my window closing... 1920s house. The windows in a 1920s house had ropes on the sides. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. And once you open that window, you don't shut it. We used to have to use soap and wax to shut the windows, right? Once they were open, they weren't going anywhere. So for, for my window to slam shut is a complete oddity all, in, all by itself. For that attic door to open and close that many times, completely at odds with anything you could imagine. That was when my dad finally said, you know, when they got home. So, yeah, the glass broke inward, so you didn't throw anything through it. So, obviously, you know, so he, he sort of deducted that, yeah, let's, let's go have a conversation about what's happening here. He explained a few things to me about the house and how the previous owner, his mother, apparently died in the house. She was ill. So, they believed that she was protecting the house. So whatever was there never hurt me, never hurt any of us, but would get angry, you know, like, mm -hmm. a, like a grumpy grandma, right? <laughs> would get <laughs> very angry every once in a while. And, and it was their way of saying, stop that. So my dad said, what is it you were doing? And, and I told him the song I was writing. He says, don't write that anymore. So believe it or not, after that, a few weeks later, as I was writing music and I was very careful not to write that, write that kind of music. I wrote my first song that actually went someplace in the world. Um, I got very fortunate to be brought into the music industry by the vice president of the Grammy Awards back in the late 80s, early 90s. And her name was Ann Ruckard. She loved the song. Basically, she was the one that introduced me to the music business at that point. And it was all because it was almost like the ghost saying, don't write that kind. You have something better in you that you got to get to. And my dad saying, change the way you're writing. And I ended up writing a smooth jazz song called In Your Eyes. It was meant, It was originally meant for George Benson. Love George Benson. Yeah, him and Lou Rawls were doing a, a project together. And I was, I was uh, with another songwriter friend of mine trying to write a song that would go good with them. And it was totally their genre. But I didn't realize it because I was young and stupid that he had already had a song called In Your Eyes. And while they liked the song, they didn't, they passed, they, they passed, right? So mm -hmm. I ended up sending it to Seattle to, to be picked up by Music Incorporated, which is Elevator Music Company, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so, so it ended up on a weather channel and hotels and all that stuff and, and shopping stores, you know, all over the place for the next 20 years. When you're talking about your house, you know, yeah. Uh, did, did your did your dad or mom did they ever witness what you witnessed? Yeah. In fact, that's I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, it sounds to me like you were talking that he's trying to pacify everything that happened by taking to, you to the attic. I was just curious, like in my book, one that, that I'm writing. I mean, it has a lot of similarities to what you're talking about. That's why I'm just sitting back. I'm kind of mesmerized because I can relate to everything you're saying. Yeah. One of the things, there's two things in particular, well, three things in particular that we all witnessed. One was sometime in the wee hours of the morning before the sun would come up, all of the foots of our beds 
my bed, my sister's bed, my parents' bed, was as if somebody was taking both their hands, you know, like the CPR position with your hands. You could take that and push down on the foot of your bed and then release it like a spring really fast. That would happen like once a week uh, where all of our beds at the same time would shake violently at the foot of our bed just for a split second. And it would wake us all up. And it, during breakfast in the morning, we'd all talk about it together. Like, all right, so did your bed move last night? Yeah, mine did too. And, you know, what time was it? Well, I don't know. I think it was, you know, this. And so there was that. And then there was a time, the times, times, it's multiple times, where I used to stay up pretty late. You know, I started writing music when I was like 13. And I would stay up really late. I would turn everything off and, and go to bed. And you would hear this whispering, almost like a DJ from a different era, like maybe a 1920s DJ on the radio, someone talking like talk radio, but not. Mm -hmm. It was coming from downstairs and it would annoy me because I was like, everybody's in bed, I think. Maybe mom left the TV on. So I'd go downstairs and I'd try to figure out where it's coming from. And I'd stand there quietly and then I'd hear it again but it was coming from upstairs, not downstairs. So I was like, oh, you big dummy. So I went back upstairs. I'm standing in the middle of the hallway. I remember this like it's yesterday. I'm standing in the middle of the hallway, looking at my bedroom, looking at the bathroom, looking at my sister's room, my parents' room, trying to figure out, all right, is it going to start again? Oh, there it is. Sure enough, it's coming from the living room downstairs. So I go back downstairs. This would go on three or four times until I give up and say, I give up. <laughs> I go to bed. My dad had the same exact experience. Like I would go to bed and maybe an hour later, he would hear it and he'd go downstairs and then upstairs and then downstairs. It would drive us absolutely nuts because wherever we were, it was coming from the opposite place from where we were. Very strange. Mm -hmm. The third one was... We had in our basement the old-fashioned washing tub. So <laughs> they used to wash their laundry in this little tub, the sink, this oversized sink, before they would hang it to dry. There's actually a place downstairs where they would hang stuff. And, you know, to turn the water on, it had these old-fashioned valves on them, and you'd really have to almost get a wrench to turn it on. My dad went downstairs in the basement one day, and steaming piping hot water was spewing out of this thing as, as fast as it could go. And he was like mesmerized, like how in the heck did that happen? Maybe it broke. So he notices that, you know, it's unwound. So he winds it back up, which is really hard to do and shuts the water off. And then he tests it a few times, he says, and he said, no, it was tight. It wasn't going to do it again. So he thought one of us kids had been down there and turned it on as a joke or something. Until he went back upstairs and turned, you know, turned to the um, dining room table where he did a lot of his work. And he heard the water downstairs again, and he went down there, and it was full bore, full blast again. And he couldn't figure out how this was happening, because even if it was pressure, it's not the type of thing where you can actually turn the dial or whatever you call it, the faucet, in such a way you know, the, the pressure that was building up wouldn't turn the, the faucet on or off. And it was hard to do anyway. So he turned it back off. And this would happen over and over again to him. So there was always these, these other things that my mom, my dad, my sister, and myself would witness together. It was it was very uncanny. Nothing ever became of it that was really uh, harmful to us. But we sold the house in 2016 and the current occupants called us up this past year and they said, did you guys ever have anything strange happen in the house? And I said, oh boy, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> and they started describing, and, they, and this is word for word, what they said, they said, well, my son is in the bedroom that has the attic door in it, which is right across from the, the bathroom. And I said, yeah, I know that room. That used to be my room. Well, the attic door keeps opening all by itself. We put stuff in front of it. We do, th this door just has a mind of its own and, and opens up. And we're a little bit, we were a little bit nervous because we're very, they're, they're a very good Christian sort of family that, that, you know, believes in a lot of different things. And they wanted to make sure they weren't in any sort of trouble. And I said, well, what do you think? And he goes, no, I don't think this is anything bad. I think it's something good. I said, okay, well, 
um, just know that we experienced all those things and more. And he goes, well, tell me some of the things you experienced. And I told him, he says, yep, that old radio is still playing in this house. We can't figure out where it's coming from. So whatever happened to me and my family is still going on there. So there's something playing itself out over and over in that house, whether it's an intelligent phenomenon or if it's sort of like a, a tape recorder playing over and over again, you know, um, I have no idea. Did anybody ever do a, uh, like a background check of the, of the house, the history of it? I did because I, I started writing another book. I'm writing three books right now. Um, oh, wow. yeah, I'm a, a <laughs> I'm uh, I'm nuts. <laughs> You're like a glutton for punishment. Yeah. So the the other book is called The Attic, believe it or not, and um, it's about it's sort of based loosely based on a true story, but it's it, it goes into some deeper stuff. So it's it's actually a, a work of fiction. But I ended up for that book doing a lot of discovery, like you know what is the genealogy of the family that used to live there and that built the house, and then I found out that the father built the next door neighbor's house as well. It's a smaller house. And he built that so his son could move in and live next to him and his mom. And he never did do that. So they ended up renting that house out several times. And then finally, someone bought it. But interestingly, someone was murdered in that house. I'm just going to say somebody died in that house. Somebody died in the house next to ours. And Whenever you would cross over from our property, one step onto that property, it smelled, I can't even describe the smell. It's almost like rotten grass. Uh There was a rotting smell. And when you go to the front door and you'd see the wall, the drywall or the plaster wall, always had this black stain. They would say they would paint over it over and over again and the black stain would reappear. So one of my friends was a, was a wannabe carpenter at that point and said, why don't you just replace that whole wall? And they ended up replacing the whole wall. They tore the wall down to the frame, threw out all the plaster, thinking maybe there was a mold problem, replaced the plaster wall with a drywall and painted it, did, did all the spackling, all that stuff. And within four months, four months, that black stain was in the same exact spot. There was something very evil in that house. There's no question because everybody that's lived in that house, something horrible happened to them. Anybody try to do a cleansing of the house? Yeah, they had a priest come over there a couple times and uh, nothing ever happened. You know, incidentally, I was raised Catholic and Christian, but disclaimer, no offense to anybody. I'm, I'm very religiously agnostic. I'm a spiritual woman, but I'm not I'm not a religious person at all, right? I teach their own. You know, they they went mm-hmm. and did that, and it didn't work for to me for obvious reasons. But you know, the thing is, is that there are things we can't explain. You know, there's I believe there is more to this universe than what we can see, touch, smell, and hear. And I think that it's you know possibly you know a multitude of universes or different frequencies and these different vibrational frequencies all interact or have interplay and you know what we think are ghosts could actually be something in a different dimension you know peeking through who knows you know I have I have my own belief system I guess you would call it you know mm-hmm. I find it all fascinating a lot of our teachings is bringing up you know, people's mindsets are you know there, there's no ghosts there's no UFOs uh, all of that. I was just curious, like even on your house, you know, I can, I can relate so much on everything you're talking about from the attic to the, to the door, to the, you know, cool breeze, everything. And you're saying like earlier, sometimes you have to see it to believe it. I think a lot of people are on that same mindset that uh, unless it kicks you in the butt, you're not going to believe it. Anything in life, nothing happens to you. You just fully don't understand. It's true. Look at me, you know, trying to explain to people that don't understand what it is to be born trans. You know, our house was never blessed in that regard, but the house next door was. But you can carry a spirit to, from one place to another. I mean, l- let's be honest. Yeah. All of us, all of us have, you know, sort of a belief system about all of these various things that happen. And, and what I, what I ended up with, because, you know, one thing that I've been able to do since I was very little was what we call astral project. 
I didn't know that was the word that was used and I didn't know that's what I was doing, but I would end up with bouts of sleep paralysis where you wake up and your body's paralyzed, but your mind is awake. Uh-huh. Did you ever have that happen to you? Sleep paralysis? Never. No, but I've uh, had guests on that have talked to me about that. Yeah. It's the most spooky thing in the world that happened to you. Cause you think you're dying and you actually can't move and you could swear to God, there's somebody in the room that's about to get you and you're trying to shake yourself awake. And it happens over and over again to some people. And for me, it happened for years until I finally got unafraid. And I said, all right, if there's someone in here, I actually got rational because you're actually semi-conscious. Your brain is awake, but your body's asleep because we, we secrete a hormone that makes you not carry out your dreams in real life, right? So when you're in REM sleep, your body is actually paralyzed. And the reason you go through sleep paralysis is because that drug, that hormone has not yet worn off yet, even though your brain woke up. How do you separate sleep paralysis and uh, astral projection from, like, say, a nightmare? All right. So here's, here's the interesting part. So when I would have sleep paralysis, I, I started to recognize the, the uh, coming on of the sleep paralysis. And what would happen, sometimes it would just hit you and you just sort of wake up paralyzed and be freaked out. Other times you can actually feel it coming and there's this buzzing sensation. Everybody has sort of a a different sound or something that happens to them. But all in all, if I say this right now to your audience and somebody has experienced sleep paralysis, they're, they're going to, they're going to understand what I'm talking about. There's this buzzing sensation, almost like an electrical vibration in the back of your head, almost like you stuck your hand in the wall socket. There's no electrocution feeling except the back of your head, you know, it, it, it has this electrical buzzing going on and it's very loud and you can hear the buzzing. Sometimes you can hear what sounds like dishes or pots and pans clinging and clanging or very loud voices uh, or other, you know, you know, these other sounds that you can't quite make out what it is. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're in your room, you're awake, your eyes are open, by the way. And because my mom has come into my bedroom during one of several of my bouts with with this, and she said, you scared me so badly, honey. And she'd be crying. She goes, I thought you were, I thought you died because your eyes were open and you weren't moving. You know, she was so scared. And because it's freaky to see your kid laying there with their eyes wide open, not blinking, And not moving when she's calling the name. It freaked her out. Uh Uh, So, you know, she was able to get me out of the sleep paralysis at that time. And what happens after you stop being afraid of it, because there is someone in the room, like a dark shadow, people claim, is in the room with you trying to get you. And what I found and what I started teaching people is stop being afraid. It's not going to hurt you. You know, if something was going to hurt you, it would have already done it already. Uh What I suggest to people is get over your fear, allow the sleep paralysis to take its course, because what happens next is incredible. Once you get past the bout of terror with the sleep paralysis, you start to realize many things can happen. For me, my legs would start lifting off the bed. Now, from a physical standpoint, my my legs didn't move at all. They're on the bed. But from some other sense, sense of being, my legs were floating above my body, like, like they were lifting up as if I was doing an exercise in the gym by lifting my legs up. And then my torso and my head would sort of lift up. And I I'd find myself, I guess, sitting uh, is the only way I could describe it. And then maybe a split second later, I'm rolling and I'm about five inches above my body, looking down as I'm facing towards the the left-hand side of the room with my arm outstretched. You know, that's just the way I had been sleeping and I can see myself sleeping. And here's the weird part. We had a nightlight in my bedroom and it was pretty bright. So it would light up the the bathroom, right? Attached to the bedroom. Everything was 70% darker. So here I was in my room. I'm floating above myself, looking at myself sleep. I'm looking into the bathroom and I can see the nightlight, but everything is 70% darker. So picture nighttime, which is already really dark, now goes 70% darker than dark. That's pretty dark, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so the funny thing is, is you can actually hear everything that's going on in your room as well. So I always needed a fan in order to go to sleep. I needed that white noise. So 
I could hear my fan. And I remember, I don't know if I was standing, floating. I, I don't know how to describe this, but I moved out of my bedroom and into my son's room where I was sort of low to the ground, almost like I was sitting Indian style, Mm -hmm. but I was not. I don't think I was sitting. The only way I can describe it is it felt like I was sitting Indian style, but I wasn't. I was hovering real low to the ground, whatever. He had a friend over sleeping in in a sleeping bag on the floor next to him, and he was in the bed sleeping, and they were both sound asleep. And I was like, you know, it's it's the middle of January, and I'm so content. I have my, my, my son is, is sleeping in bed. His friend is comfortable. Everything's good with the world. There was this peaceful feeling that went over me, even though I'm still in my bedroom because I could still hear the fan. That's the oddity of all this. And whatever it was moved me into the hallway and I was fixated on the fireplace at the end of the hallway. And within a split second, boom, I was in front of the fireplace. And then I was fixated on the front door. And then boom, I was right in front of the front door hovering six feet above the front door in front of my house in the middle of a snowstorm in the middle of January in upstate New York. I couldn't feel any cold, but I can tell you that I could hear the wind blowing. I could see the snow drifts. I could see the snow falling. I could see my neighbor's house across the street. At the same time, I could hear the fan, the whir of the fan in my bedroom, and I could see the bathroom in my bedroom. So I was seeing the bathroom in my bedroom. I was seeing my neighbor's house, the snow piling up outside and the wind blowing and hearing the fan all at the same time. I call that duality. I was in two places at the same time. It was really complicated, but I felt like, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to fly over to my neighbor's house. Because when you're in this sense of being, it's this utter freedom like you've never felt before you know, the freest of free, like you were a dog inside of a little dog cage for 12 years and never got let out. And then one day, the owner, as cruel as that might be, finally opens the cage door and lets you out of this little tiny, you know, dog cage that you've been in your whole life in front of uh, a 4,000 yard or whatever uh, acre forest or field. It lets you run, run, run all the way around, right? You just Mm -hmm. have this euphoric sense of freedom. And as soon as I tried to fly, I got snapped back into, I felt this pain in my back. I got snapped back into my body, into the bedroom, and I woke up for real. That was trippy. That was weird. So this duality, because, you know, I I think about stuff like that. I'm kind of a geeky girl. So so I, I started thinking about, like, quantum mechanics and superposition and, you know, we've only started discovering that even though, you know, all of that is almost actually to the day, almost a hundred years old quantum mechanics, you know, we're just now starting to really understand the depth of what quantum mechanics really means and superposition and being in two places at the same exact time, which is impossible in the world of general physics. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think that once we get further along down this path, we're going to start understanding more about the paranormal and paranormal experiences because of that, because those types of experiences always happened to me and it was always in my bedroom. So you said, what's the difference between a dream and that a dream is sort of random and can place you in different you know, situations, different locations with different people, so on and so forth. Whereas when you're in the astral dimension and at the lowest level of the astral plane, by the way, it's darker, 70% darker, but you're still in the same room you were in, except here's the key. Everything's backwards. It's like you're in a mirror. So if there's a picture on the left-hand side of the wall, it's now on the right. Mm -hmm. Everything is in the exact replica or mirror image of, of the room, which is really hard to figure out. And when you're in that realm, you still follow the rules of physics if you're not really good with it. So when you first start to travel with astral projection, as I found out it was called, I was still grounded to reality, to the physics of Earth. Like, I didn't realize I was in the ethereal plane, and I didn't realize that the laws of physics don't really encapsulate me anymore, that I'm not part of the laws of physics. My brain, however, which was semi-conscious, 
made me believe that. Right. As you're laying there, your your body's on another plane. Yeah. So you're still in your body, believe it or not. So you don't leave your body. It's not like your soul departs you completely, just a piece of your soul. Uh So we have an ethereal body, right? So we have these different, we are, you know, whether you're religious, spiritual, or, or one of those, a mixture of those two, we are light beings. We are this existence that is temporary. We are immortal beings trapped inside of a three-dimensional temporary experience. That's the way I like to put it. I ask about the the nightmares because I had a past guest on that was a psychic. And after the show, we were in a conversation about dreams. It's uh, really a deep topic. Yeah. Did they explain lucid dreams to you? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Listening to your sleep paralysis and the... uh, astral projection you know yeah you you really explained it very well because i didn't know too much about that oh thank you i didn't really know a lot about it either i was experiencing something that i wasn't educated on i'm definitely gonna have you have you back on the show and i do appreciate you coming today and uh, where, where can they go to you know some links you have through my website amberrosewashington.com that's my link is for my current book that's out i have two more books due to be out that uh, if I don't get them done soon, my publisher is going to, you know, probably ground me. That website, you know, I'm on a multitude of of podcasts and, you know, you could just Google the name Amber Rose Washington and it'll bring you to a multitude of different things uh, that I'm involved in right now. That's quite a bit. I, I really appreciate you being on and sharing your stories and I, I do appreciate that. Oh, no, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Amber Rose Washington. I love it when I learn new things off my guests. And that's what it's all about, sharing and learning and sharing your stories. And Amber had some great stories today. I really do appreciate that. Check out Amber's links at the bottom of this episode. And please go rate and review Ghost in the Valley podcast on Apple. I really do appreciate that. I will see you in two weeks on Ghosts in the Valley podcast.